terror update. The FBI reveals new information linking the San Bernardino shooting suspects with jihad. Debating national security. Protecting us from terror is the dominant issue at Tuesday's debate in Las Vegas. Money laundering. The Vatican's financial institution freezes assets, but no indictments yet. And Dawn Mass. We take you to the Philippines, where the faithful are preparing for Christmas. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, December 16th, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Breaking news tonight from the recent San Bernardino terror attack. The FBI director today says the shooting suspect pledged allegiance to jihad in late 2013 using direct messaging on Twitter. The FBI would not have been able to see this information without a court order. We go to the White House for more on this story with Lauren Ashburn. Lauren? Brian, what we are seeing is that the FBI says it's very difficult to clamp down on online recruiting. And without tech companies' help, it seems like there's no solution in sight. Everybody in this room knows this, but it's worth reminding folks that your parents' al-Qaeda was a very different model than the threat we face today. FBI Director James Comey spoke out again this morning about the challenges facing law enforcement. He blamed the issues primarily on social media, saying it was an easy way to crowdsource potential terrorists. The threat came from ISIL through social media, which had revolutionized the way all of us connect to each other, and they made it revolutionize terrorism because they sent their twin prong message of come or kill out through the chaotic spider web, especially of Twitter. He called ISIS's recruiting a chaotic spider web and repeatedly used what he believed to be ISIS's mantra, come or kill. And he outlined why the FBI can't track encrypted mobile messaging apps. The most dangerous people to us that we are tracking disappear when they are on the cusp of the most dangerous manifestation of their radicalization. That is a big problem. We call this the going dark challenge. Last week, the director went before the Judiciary Committee asking if a judge issues an order for encrypted information, a tech company should be able to figure out a way to get that information to the judge. Lawmakers pushed back, saying the government shouldn't be telling companies how to operate. Brian, this is a classic privacy issue, and there are many people who say this type of conversation should not even be happening in the public square. And Lauren, what is the word today from the Homeland Security Secretary on updating the terror alert system? He came out today, Secretary Jay Johnson came out, and he said that he has come up with a new advisory level called a bulletin. And then he issued that bulletin. And it says that we will now see increased police presence at public events. Lauren Ashburn at the White House. Thank you, Lauren. Meanwhile, the U.S. meets with Iraqi military and political leaders trying to expand the fight against ISIS. Defense Secretary Ash Carter makes an unannounced trip to the war zone trying to broaden U.S. assistance. Iraqi leaders are reluctant to embrace a U.S. plan to send more attack helicopters and more troops into that fight. And on Capitol Hill here in Washington, Republicans and Democrats reach a deal on the budget. Now party leaders push to pass a Christmas compromise through the House and Senate by the end of the week. Jason Calvi is here with more. Jason? Brian, the House will vote on a tax package on Thursday and then the spending bill on Friday. There are winners and losers in both parties. Republican victories include lifting a ban on exporting crude oil, getting some permanent tax breaks. Democrats won wind and solar energy credits and tax credits for college costs, children, and lower-income families. Representative Jim Jordan, the House Freedom Caucus chairman, is disappointed two issues weren't included in the budget, making it harder for Syrian refugees to enter the U.S. as one, the other, protecting conscience rights and cutting Planned Parenthood funding. So, those are the things we want. It's frustrating. It seems so obvious to me when you have the, 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 the overwhelming support of the American people for that, uh, for those issues, mm -hmm. it makes no sense not to include them. Meanwhile, our White House correspondent, Lauren Ashburn, asked the White House if the deal is a sign of a new bipartisan leadership under House Speaker Paul Ryan. 
There certainly has been a willingness on the part of Speaker Ryan uh, and other leading Republicans in Congress, he wasn't the only person involved, uh, in trying to find common ground between Democrats and Republicans. Congressman Chris Smith tells me Speaker Ryan fought to include the pro-life language in the budget, but he says the president and his party wouldn't budge. Brian? So Jason, will the president sign the tax and spending bill? The White House has indicated the president will do that, but first, the Senate and the House need to approve them. All right, thank you, Jason Calvi. We'll have more analysis in just a little bit. Meanwhile, security tops the list of issues debated by the Republican presidential candidates in Las Vegas Tuesday night on CNN. The Republican presidential hopefuls all say they have a plan to stop ISIS and keep America secure, but no surprise, personalities clashed. Donald, you know, is great at, at the uh, one-liners, but he's a chaos candidate, and he'd be a chaos president. He would not be the commander-in-chief we need to keep our country safe. Jeb doesn't really believe I'm unhinged. He said that very simply because he has failed in this campaign. It's been a total disaster. Nobody cares. Senator Ted Cruz, who's gaining ground in recent polls in Iowa, spent much of his time taking on fellow Senator Marco Rubio, mostly on their voting records on immigration and national security. As far as Ted's record, I'm always puzzled by his attack on this issue. Ted, you support legalizing people who are in this country illegally. Ted Cruz supported a 500% increase in the number of H-1B visas, the guest workers that are allowed into this country, and Ted supports doubling the number of green cards. It is not accurate what he just said, that I supported legalization. Indeed, I led the fight against his legalization and amnesty bill. Carly Fiorina says neither is up to the task of being president. To wage war, we need a commander-in-chief who has made tough calls in tough times and stood up to be held accountable over and over, not first-term senators who never made an executive decision in their life. Meanwhile, Donald Trump denies hints he's considering a third-party run. Uh, I am totally committed to the Republican Party. I feel very honored to be the front-runner. Meanwhile, Kate Martell, political reporter for The Hill, is joining us in studio. What do you look for th from the polls in the next coming days or so? Well, the two people I'm most interested to see are Jeb Bush and New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. They both had outstanding performances yesterday, and the reason I say outstanding is because people had written off both of them as nominees. Um, Chris Christie has been uh, was on the happy hour debate stage for the last debate and rose back to the main debate stage, while Jeb Bush is polling right now at 4% nationally. So I think it's interesting to see that they both had strong debate performances, and can they really come back? I think the other two people are to notice in the coming debate days, in the coming poll days, are Senators Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. They both have carved out their bases of support, and they're really showing that they can potentially be the nominees if it's against Donald Trump when it comes down to the end. So it'll be interesting to see where they land. These national polls, are they really accurate in predicting how people will vote? So it's an easy mistake to look at national polls. National polls do show what people are feeling that day. But actually, if you want to look at where the voters are thinking, you need to look at the early states. That's Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada. That's what people are really thinking, and that's what's going to come down to the states. And I think it's also interesting to note that yesterday's debate was the last one of 2015. We have seven weeks until the Iowa caucuses. And yes, the polls are starting to matter, and they're starting to show what people are actually thinking and what could translate into votes. But still, seven weeks away, a lot can happen. And just one more debate before the Iowa caucus, right? One more debate before the Iowa caucuses, yes. 2016. Kate Martell, thanks for joining us tonight. We appreciate the insight you had. Thanks so much for having me. Other stories our EWTN News nightly team is covering in today's world. A judge today declares a mistrial in the case of a Baltimore police officer charged in the death of Freddie Gray. The jury could not reach a verdict after three days of del deliberations in the manslaughter trial of William Porter. Porter is the first of six officers to stand trial on charges stemming from Gray's arrest and death in April. He died after suffering a broken neck in the back of a police van while he was handcuffed and shackled. A Canadian pastor gets a life sentence with hard labor from North Korea's Supreme Court for what it calls crimes against the state. Hyun Soo Lim was detained in North Korea last February. No one heard from him until he appeared at a news conference in Pyongyang in July. There, he admitted to plotting the overthrow of the North Korean state. 
North Korea's National Defense Commission rebukes claims that he was forced to confess. Pastor Lim raised support for humanitarian projects in North Korea. He made dozens of trips from Toronto to North Korea before his arrest. Students returned to class a day after an email threat triggered a shutdown of public schools in Los Angeles. 640,000 students were sent home Tuesday after a school board member received an email threatening a large-scale attack. New York City schools received a similar threat. Officials there concluded that it was a hoax. A high school football coach suspended for praying at midfield after games files a discrimination complaint. Coach Joe Kennedy's complaint with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission claims that his prayer was private and silent. It alleges that Bremerton, Washington School District discriminated against him by suspending him in October. Well, the Holy Father warns pilgrims against those seeking to profit from the Jubilee Year of Mercy. The Pope saying salvation cannot be bought. La salvezza non si compra. La porta è Gesù. E the, Gesù Pope, è gratis. the Pope's warning comes a day after thousands of fake apostolic blessings were seized from a souvenir shop near the Vatican. The Vatican asked pilgrims to be vigilant, not only of terror threats, but also scam artists. Vatican prosecutors launched 13 investigations into suspected money laundering this year. A new report reveals that the equivalent of about $12 million has been frozen by the Vatican's financial institution. European anti-money laundering experts published these findings. They praised the Holy See for addressing most of the legal loopholes that they flagged in a 2012 evaluation. But their report says prosecutors have yet to hand down any money laundering indictments. Tommaso de Russa is the director of the Vatican's Financial Intelligence Authority. That's the office that oversees financial reform in the Vatican. Tommaso, I know you can't name names, but can you give us any idea who these blocked accounts belong to? Are they companies, individuals? Uh, good evening, Brian, and thank you. Uh, when the first AMSCFT legislation in the Vatican was introduced and established, we started with a review of all the accounts owned by customers in Vatican financial, financial institutions. And uh, at the end, the decision was to close, uh, considering the total amount of customers of 15,000, to close 4,800 customers not considering in line with the new MLCFT legislation and the categories of customers allowed to have services in, in, the, in the Vatican City States. So without entering into details, there were natural or legal persons not belonging to the organization of the Catholic Church uh, to the Holy See and Vatican City State. So who is allowed to have a Vatican account and why do people want them so much? Currently, the categories of customers allowed to have these services from the financial institutions in the Vatican are employees of the Holy See and the Vatican City States, organs of the Holy See and the Vatican City States, embassies of states accredited to the Holy See, and entities of the Catholic Church. The financial institution uh, of the Vatican is an instrumentality, is an entity of the Holy See, so this is conceived as to be a service to the Church and to the entities of the Holy See of the, the Catholic Church. So it is not a bank as such. We need to make that clear. It is a financial institution within the Vatican. Are you confident, Tommaso, that the reforms will actually uh, make a difference, that the reforms in progress will work? We are quite confident. Uh, there is a proper and solid institutional and legal framework, and this is well recognized by uh, international bodies. Just considering the recent publication of the second progress report by Monival, the Committee of Experts of the Council of Europe. Uh, there are good progresses, uh, still our commitment. Tommaso Di Russa, we appreciate you joining us from Rome tonight. Thanks for your insight on this very important topic. Thank you, Brian. Good evening. In an EWTN News Nightly exclusive, the Kentucky County clerk jailed for not issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples speaks out. Kim Davis tells us she understands the Vatican's silence on her September meeting with Pope Francis. Is that the Vatican distancing itself from you? Oh, I would say so. Anybody in their right mind would probably not want to be in the center of it. I mean, as far as, you know, just the... Um, the attention and the, the drama and everything. I think the Vatican is trying to uh, 
take three or four steps back. Davis met with the Holy Father at the Vatican Embassy here in Washington, D.C. She claims Vatican officials began planning the meeting while she was still in jail. Watch our exclusive interview with new details about that meeting tomorrow night on EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, dialogue between faiths and within faiths encouraged to counter violence. And it's not Lucky Lindy's plane, but it sure looks just like it down to the tiniest detail. Raise your voice and tell the good news. Behold, the Lord God comes with power. Today's gospel acclamation. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Faith leaders come together at Georgetown University here in Washington to formulate a response to violence inspired by religious extremism. Wyatt Goolsby is here with that story. Yeah, Brian, today's meeting brought different people of faith together to pray for solidarity, understanding, and peace. The biggest surprise, though, came when Vice President Joe Biden made an appearance hugging a Muslim student who had just spoken about her faith. The vice president embracing Lila Brothers, a Georgetown student who spoke about the challenges facing Muslims in America today. Both she and the vice president condemned Islamophobia. Biden says religious diversity is part of the American story. Imam Talib Sharif from Washington told me interfaith events like these can counter religious extremism. We come here upon that shared platform of love, care, concern, want to be protected and want to have an environment that protects you so you can, be, you can fulfill the potential that God put in you when he sent you here. The vice president's speech comes as the Obama administration urges the nation not to discriminate against Muslims after the San Bernardino shooting. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi also made a surprise visit as well. Washington's Archbishop Cardinal Donald Worrell spoke about religious freedom for all faith communities. Brian. Wyatt Goolsby, thank you. And Jerusalem's top-ranking Roman Catholic leader calls for an end to the sale of weapons to ISIS. He also calls for dialogue within religions to stem extremism. Between dialogue uh, Christian and Jews, Christians and Muslims, I think we need another dialogue, Muslim and Muslim, and Jews and Jews between themselves, because we are not dealing with one voice, one party. We need, we need all kinds of dialogue. Patriarch Twal is appealing to Israel and Palestinian leaders for courage to end the latest round of violence in the Middle East. Advocates gather on Capitol Hill today, drawing attention to what many believe is the genocide of Christians in the Middle East. Three months have passed since Nebraska Representative Jeff Fortenberry introduced a resolution calling the persecution genocide. We asked him why the House still has not voted. We get caught up in what we call the tyranny of the urgent, whether it's a budget matter or some agriculture policy or some energy policy, and all of that's important. But there are certain things that are essential. This is essential because this is a persecution of a group of people simply because of what they believe. Democrat Anna Ishu is one of 162 co-sponsors of that resolution. Nina Shea, director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute, joins us. Why do you compare the persecution of Christians and other religious minorities to the Jewish Holocaust? Well, the Christians in Iraq and Syria are being deliberately targeted for religious reasons um, by ISIS and other Islamic extremists. Um, everybody in that region, of course, is suffering the effects of war and conflict, including the Christians. But the Christians and the Yazidis are absolutely targeted for their faith and only for their faith. They don't hold any power, so they're not being, the, the power is not being contested, they just want to purify the land. There is talk of declaring the persecution of Yazidis a genocide, but Christians are not included, I guess because there's some confusion over a tax that Christians may be able to pay to stay alive. Under traditional Islamic law, there's something called a jizya, which is a tax that was meant to uh, humiliate the Christians, or, uh, put them in their place, and also to slowly erode their attachment to their faith over time because it was a hardship. Um, there, in exchange, Christians for paying this money were given protection by the authorities by the rulers and also the right to worship. Now, in, under ISIS, there's absolutely no evidence of any Christian life in either Raqqa or Mosul, the two cities that have this supposed option for Christians. All the mosques we know, I mean, all the churches in Mo Mosul, we know have been either turned into mosques 
or destroyed. Uh, there are gold domes painted black, their crosses taken down. There's no priests, there's no masses, no liturgies. There's no uh, public display or even any evidence of a private display of, of, of Christian life. Christian life has been wiped out in those areas by the Islamic State. Now, you were behind a letter with the Knights of Columbus asking for a meeting with the administration about this. Have you heard anything back? No, not yet. It's been 11 days today, and um, we wrote the letter to Secretary Kerry asking for an opportunity to brief him on the fact that Christians are suffering genocide. Um, it, we, we didn't want him to just read about it in the letter. We wanted to have a delegation, a prominent delegation, and the signatories included Cardinal Wuerl, the head of the Knights of Columbus, Carl and Anderson, the heads of the Assemblies of God, the, head, the spokesman for the Southern Baptist, uh, the, the dean of the uh, Cathedral of St. John the Divine, the Episcopal Church in, um, in New York, uh, the uh, Center for American Progress scholar, and so on and so on. There are about 30 very distinguished names. We wanted to come in, a, a delegation of us, to come in and brief an opportunity to brief him on genocide. We have not heard anything. And we'll look for an update from you. Nina Thank Shea, you. thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you, Brian. An exact replica of Charles Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis is now airborne. The plane debuts in a New York State vintage air show next year. The Spirit of St. Louis still soars. A replica of the historic plane Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic in 1927 has been rumbling in the skies above New York's Hudson Valley. The plane replicates Lindbergh's original down to the last strut and gauge. It's a celebration of a pioneering era from vintage aviation buffs at the old Rhinebeck Aerodome. More than anything, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a culmination of a dream. Lindbergh became an international star after his solo nonstop flight. The plane, built over 60 hectic days, is now displayed at the Smithsonian. The Spirit replica took years of work, mostly by retired flight engineer Ken Cassens. The 71-year-old aerodome pilot and mechanic grew up fascinated with Lindbergh. It's a, a great feeling of uh, accomplishment and um, a lot of pride, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into it. So. Cassens took over the project after the death of Aerodome founder Cole Palin. Cassens studied old photos and even examined the original to get everything right down to the wicker pilot seat. I went down to the Smithsonian years ago on two different occasions, and they took me up in the cherry picker because it was up in the ceiling, and I was able to take photographs and measurements of all the things that we had questions on. The replica made its maiden voyage recently. No trip to Paris for this plane. The not-for-profit Aerodome will add it to its vintage air shows next year. A winged reminder of a young pilot who flew his way into history. Up next, markets react to reports of the first interest rate hike from the Federal Reserve in nearly a decade. And a centuries-long tradition continues as Catholics in the Philippines begin a Christmas novena with dawn mass. Some of the pilgrims gathering today at St. Peter's Square to see Pope Francis. Thanks for joining us on this Thursday evening. I'm Brian Patrick, or Wednesday, I'm sorry. We could now face modestly higher interest rates in some loans. After years of record low rates, the Federal Reserve today raised rates to 0.5%. That's a quarter percent increase. The Fed signals that further rate hikes will likely be made slowly as the economy strengthens. Back to the budget bill now. Bill Hoagland, senior vice president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, spending more than two decades as a staff member of the Senate Budget Committee. What do you see as the good and the bad of Congress in this package, well, this thank, agreement? Thank you, Brian. The good news here is, of course, is the government will continue to function. It will not shut down this evening as it was originally planned if we had not done had reached this agreement. Uh, the good news also is that there's some sensible policy provisions in this particular proposal and as it relates to uh, lifting the oil import ban, uh, uh, export ban, having a child tax credit, making the R&D tax credit, the research and development tax credit permanent over a period of time. These are all good aspects of the particular uh, package that they are considering. And 
again, and most importantly, of course, it is a it appears to be it will be a bipartisan agreement. Going What's forward. the bad side? The bad side of this is, of course, that uh, it costs a lot of money. It's about it'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of about eight hundred billion dollars that's added to our deficit going forward. One hundred and sixty of that in this year alone. Uh, it's unfortunate that we can't do this in a way that can make it make it fiscally responsible without adding to an already a nineteen twenty trillion dollar debt that we have on the same day that the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. You called it a messy road to this agreement. How do we clean up that act? Well, I think we clean it up by we do it the real regular order, which means that we pass individual bills on time. We don't do this at the end of the uh, rush to get out of town uh, for a holiday season and put it all in one big package. We do it the way it's supposed to be done, which is take these individual bills throughout the year, don't do it at the last minute, and, and cram it into one large 2,000-page bill. Bill Hoagland, thanks for your insight. We appreciate you. Well, Catholics in the Philippines prepare for Christmas with a tradition dating back centuries. They attend Mass at dawn in Las Piñas, beginning a novena leading up to Christmas. The faithful came in the rain to observe the tradition known as Simbang. They tell us they're seeking divine help and giving thanks for their blessings. And on that note, for the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night. God bless you.